Now open your Bibles to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. If you're using one of those pew Bibles there on the rack in front of you, it's on page 761. All the notes in Scripture are also in the YouVersion Bible app under the events section with some um, devotions for this week. And actually, the devotion for this week sets up next week. Next week's going to be very important. And so the, the devotion for the adults in there sets us up for that uh, next week. So Joel chapter 2, we're going to start down in verse 15. But this week in my house, the, my boys saw a commercial. And uh, uh, it was for some Xbox game. Has anybody ever played a video game in their entire life? Ever? Cell phone game, video console game. And some of you are ashamed to raise your hand, but yes, okay. Um, even back on the old Nokia phones, the Snake game that counts too. But anyway, uh, they saw a commercial for an Xbox game, and as kids tend to do, they they talk about uh, things as though they are absolute experts, even though they don't always know everything. They continue to to spew forth things, just acting like they know it all. And and some of them grow up and still do that, uh, to you know, when you're an adult. But uh, they were talking about Xbox and video games and the history of video games in their eight years of life and all that, that went on with that. <clears throat> but uh, it was a video game for an Xbox One game. And they talked about, well, there, there's been more Xboxes than the one that's out now. There was Xbox 360. And then Caleb, our oldest, spoke up, you know, as the expert. He's the oldest. He knows everything. Well, even before that, back in ancient times, there was just the Xbox it didn't even have the 360 on the end. Oh, <laughs> I didn't tell him. We didn't even get into Super Nintendo or Atari or any of that stuff. I mean, we just started. Let's just stop in the early 2000s with the Xbox. Uh, and they, they came to the realization that I had owned one at one point, original Xbox, way back in the day. And I can remember that little deal. Being in college, not having a job, being out of my parents' house, not getting an allowance, but saving up to buy an Xbox. Because in college, what this was, you know, this was pre, you know, mass internet days. There was still the internet back then for some of you younger people, but it wasn't as prevalent as it is today. What we would do if we wanted to play uh, against some guys in another room, we would take an, an internet cord, ethernet cord, and run it between our Xboxes, and we could hear them down the hall yelling about what we were doing on our Xbox, and they could hear us. Anyway, it was a thing. And so I wanted to get one. And so I saved and saved and, you know, not having a job, not having an allowance for my parents. It took several years to get this money. Whenever my grandparents would come into town, that's when I would get a little cash and I'd, you know, stick it away. Thank goodness for grandparents. But uh, I, I would save up this money. And finally, I got enough money to buy this Xbox. And I go and I buy it. And, you know, over the time, and then you buy some more control. It, it's a racket. You buy controllers, and you buy more games, and you buy all this stuff, and then it breaks, and you got to get anyway. And so, bought all this stuff. We got all the controllers, got the games, and we're playing. And uh, I, and it was a great bonding experience. I can, I can, I have some very vivid memories. My roommate at the time, he was a Marine, and we would stay up late into the night playing video games because he had just gotten out of uh, OCS and. And so he didn't have video games there, obviously. And uh, we would play late into the night and got to get to talk about a lot of things. And, um, but it was really my senior year of college. I had this Xbox, and I played it. But then college was over. And I moved. I'd gotten a job at a church, moved in with a family, and the Xbox just kind of sat under the TV. You know, I didn't touch it. didn't really have time to touch it. You know, I didn't, you know, really had a bunch of other things going on. And then I moved into an apartment and still a lot of stuff going on, working at the church, doing all this. And, you know, then uh, for some reason, I don't know why, uh, I, I had zero time after that. Um, I mean, of course, you know, I was dating and got engaged. And so that kind of took away any potential video game time. Uh, but it was more fun spending time with her than playing video games. Uh, and so... The Xbox began to grow dusty and all this stuff and the pile of games and we got married and moved in the house and still, maybe out of some boyish hope, I still put it under the TV and plugged it in. Uh, it never turned it on, but it was there just in case I wanted to. And then we started having kids and uh, it came time, as it tends to do, when you get married and you have kids, you have a garage sale. And, you know, it's my opinion, garage sales not to make money, it's to get rid of junk. 
And there's been occasions when we've done a garage sale with, like, Katie's family when everybody's off doing something and I'm the only one left out in the yard tending the stuff, which is always dangerous because if somebody comes up and says, I'll give you a penny for everything in the yard, I'll say, yes, take it away. I don't want it. You can take, you throw it in the dumpster. I'll give you a dollar. I will pay you to get rid of it. And so we ended up selling the Xbox, this thing I had saved up for years. I had been so excited about, you know, sacrificed to, to buy this thing, sold the Xbox and the, however, fit, 10, 15, 20 games, uh, all the controllers, the whole deal, whole package for like 25 bucks. And uh, at that point, you know, I just wanted it gone, you know, empty space, get rid of the thing. And the point of that is, a lot of times we will sacrifice and we will scrimp and we will save for this one thing. And we may use it for a period of time and be all about that one thing for a period of time. But then we kind of shove it away and we neglect it. And, and we take it and we, we don't think of uh, that thing having as much worth as we did before we bought the thing. And the picture of what we're going to see today in Joel chapter 2 is this is kind of the story of, of the Holy Spirit with us. Is God sacrificed a lot to give us the Holy Spirit in, in sending Jesus to die and raise from the dead. He sacrifices his son. We get the Holy Spirit. And, and, and initially, it may be a very exciting thing. Even on occasion, it may be very exciting. We get filled up with the Spirit, and we get pumped up. But then it begins to dissipate. And, and we know the Holy Spirit's great. The Holy Spirit is God. It's God's presence in us. But in our actions and our words and the way we live, we don't hold it or hold him, the Holy Spirit, to the esteem that he truly deserves, or the esteem, at the very least, that God sacrificed to get him to us. So look in Joel chapter 2. I want you to remember, the last several weeks we've been looking at Joel, a lot's been going on with Israel. They had locusts come and destroy their economy. They had the, the threat of an army coming to kill everybody. God finally spoke some hope into their lives. <clears throat> and then... Now here, starting down in verse 15, we get a spiritual direction for the country. It says, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. So, God has just said in the previous verses that he is going to come and he's going to take care of business. But he says, before I come, you need to get ready for it. You need to be spiritually prepared for what's about to go down. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Zion, the heart of the nation, it is the root of the people. He says, raise the alarm, get the people ready. And he says, consecrate a fast, consecrate the congregation. That word consecrate. It's a great word, fantastic word. You should use it in your daily life, consecrate. I am consecrating these donuts for my belly. You should use that word more often. Uh, but what he is saying here with that phrase, consecrate, what it means is to remove from a certain thing, uh, remove it from common use, remove it from what was typical. And so he says, first of all, Get spiritually ready, so consecrate a fast. Remove your fasting experience from its commonplace in your mindset. Now, the people that shouldn't have had, uh, fasting shouldn't have had a, a commonplace in their mind because they were only supposed to fast once a year anyway on the Day of Atonement. And so now he is saying you only do it once a year, but for some reason in your own mindset, in your own hearts, fasting isn't as important or doesn't hold the spiritual importance for you that it should. It says you need to set yourself right here. Consecrate, remove the common use of your fasting, focus. And then he says call everybody together, solemn assembly, a purposeful gathering, and he says consecrate the congregation. That's all of the believers. He says, remove uh, from the believers, remove common use. Remove everything that is common, that is commonplace, that is regular. Remove it. Which, essentially, if you, if you really process this down and think about it, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a believer, no day should be for common use. 
If you're a believer in Jesus, no day is for common use. Every day should be exceptional. Every day should be different. Your day as a Christian should not look like anybody else's day. It should not be common. It should not be mundane because you have Jesus. And he's not common. He's not mundane at all. He is definitely unique and better, beneficial to us. Uh, so he says, consecrate, remove from it common usage. Get everybody together, gather the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. And now this was, was weird because when they would gather for church, they usually wouldn't allow the kids, especially uh, the babies, to come into their assembly because it would cause a disruption and they didn't want that to mess anything up. And so he says, this is so important for the lives of our entire people that you need to bring everybody in. Even, the, even the, the, the babies, everybody needs to be in there. And then he says, even the groom and the bride. He says, the groom needs to come in, the bride needs to come in, uh, uh, bring them back from their honeymoon. And what made this un, unbelievable in uh, requesting this to happen is the groom and the bride for, uh, in some cases, the f entire first year of their marriage were exempted from a lot of laws in their country. They didn't have to do a lot of things. They just had to focus on their marriage, focus on each other, and not do all of that stuff. And no, everybody had to leave them alone because it was part of the law. It was built into their culture. The, the bride and the groom, that first period of time, were only supposed to focus on themselves and nothing else. And so now, God, through Joel, is coming and saying, in returning spiritually to me, this is so important that not only do the kids need to come into the room, but the groom and the bride who are exempted from everything else we do, they need to come in. Everybody needs to be present and a part of this spiritual recalibration to get back to where you need to be so I can come in and intervene on your behalf. Look at verse 17. He says, between the vestibule and the altar, this is of the, of the temple, between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And so this is kind of a look at what's going to happen when everybody gets together. When they come together for church at this solemn assembly, this, this special gathering time. He says all the ministers in the entire nation get on the platform in between the vestibule and the altar in front of everybody. Have them standing up there and they're to weep and they're to pray intervention on behalf of the people. Spare your people, O Lord. Make not your heritage, make not your legacy a reproach, your inheritance a reproach. And they're supposed to intervene for all of the believers standing there before them who have gathered to seek God out. They had to, not, they had to uh, the people had to prepare themselves. The leaders had to prepare themselves so they could help prepare other people. They all had to be set up for what was coming. You know, when it comes to ourselves and being prepared for, for God's movement and, and God's hand and God's spiritual reign on our lives, we need to set up our hearts for a setup. We need to be prepared for what's coming, prepared for what God is going to lay down in the midst of us. And that's what this, these three verses here, 15 through 17, are all about, getting spiritually ready for what's about to take place. Because when God showed up, or is about to show up, the people, if they weren't prepared, God would show up, do his thing, and move on, and they would have missed out on whatever God was about to do for them, do among them, and do with them. Look at verse 18. The people have returned to him. It says, Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. And I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea, his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. So the Lord becomes jealous. He has pity on his people. He says, I'm sending you Grain, wine, oil, you will be satisfied. So God is going to not only restore what was, God is going to bring such satisfaction to them that they will, in, a, in not only a physical sense, but also a spiritual sense, be filled up. 
because they've been prepared. The groundwork's been laid. They're ready for God to come and God to do something great. And God is going to do that. And God says, it will be so much. You will be satisfied. You will be filled to the brim. This is, this is a, a, a filling of Thanksgiving proportions, unbuttoning your pants, sitting in the recliner, falling asleep, that satisfied with what I'm about to do for you. And he gives an example of that there in verse 20 when he says, I'm going to remove that northerner from you. Now look at the end of that verse that we just read. Uh, he says, this guy, this northerner, this enemy, this opposition, says he has done great things. Now that doesn't mean that this enemy who's coming against them is a good person or a good nation. He has done great things. He has done uh, exceptional things, things above the norm, above average. He is uh, not necessarily good, but he has done things of note. And uh, he says, this guy is, is powerful, and you cannot remove him yourself, but somebody else will be needed for that process. And God describes that. He says, I will drive him into a parched, desert land. I will take his vanguard, his advance guard. I will take his rear guard. I will, I will throw them into the sea. And the stench and foul smell of him will rise. Now, that right there, that phrase doesn't imply this guy hasn't bathed. I mean, he may not have. But the implication is he will be killed and the, the smell of his rotting corpse will be so massive that everyone will know God finished him off. Now, this is, this is talking about a physical enemy, but it's also talking about a spiritual one. Whether you in your life have someone physically opposing you, or you have a, a spiritual opposition coming against you uh, daily, weekly, monthly, maybe it's a health issue, whatever it is, your opposition, God can step through it with you. Even though that thing, that opposition may be great, God is too. Verse 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. So even though the opposition, the enemy has done great things, here uh, God is saying through Joel, God has done greater things. That, that thing that's coming against us may be great from your perspective, but from God's perspective, it is nothing. So it says, fear not, those, the O land, those who are being attacked. The Lord has done great things. Verse 22, fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. So he talks about rain a lot there. God is coming. God is going to deliver. Uh, you need to be rejoicing, be glad, filled with joy, because the rain is coming for your vindication. He's poured down abundant rain. Now, that God doesn't throw around words like abundant or, or blessing uh, just flippantly or randomly. When he says he's bringing abundant rain, this is going to be a phenomenal encounter here. This isn't just, just a, a sprinkle. This is a downpour that will uh, replenish all that has been devastated. He says, I am bringing abundant rain upon you, the early and the latter rain as before. Now, in Scripture, God's rain is physical, as in this case, but God's reign also represents his blessing. I want you to look with me back in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Do I have that? Okay, good. I didn't mark it in my Bible and I'd be flipping all over the place with my mic in my hand. Uh, We've got two verses in Deuteronomy 11, verses 13 and 14. And he uses uh, uh, the exact same wording here. He says... And if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the later rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. Now, in that case, again, it was physical, but it was also spiritual. God was going to do something in, uh, in among the people that was going to be just uh, uh, fantastic and phenomenal that they never saw coming. He was going to bring his reign of blessing upon their lives, but first, they had to return to him. They had to pursue him. They had to experience from him 
uh, uh, something that they needed him to accomplish. Look at verse 24. It says, The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. Now, I want you to try to paint a picture in your mind here. Do you remember these people have been just economically ravished? They've had everything that they've been working towards and, and building just destroyed by the locusts. And so not just the nation, but the individual doesn't have the financial means, not just to have a, a threshing floors, but to have them full of anything. They haven't seen that in months, possibly years, because of the way their economy has gone. They, have, they haven't seen vats filled with oil in just as much time because they haven't had the means to accomplish it. And now God is saying, I am going to do something for you that you have not been able to do for yourself for a very, very long time. I am going to do something for you that it will be so obvious when this thing occurs that it's me who does it. You can't help but praise me. I am going to throw this abundance on you in a massive way. Look at verse 25. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Now, when God says this phrase in verse 27, when he says, you will know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else. When God says that, that, that carries with it a, a sense of power, a sense of promise, almost a threat to anyone who would come against his people. You know, you come against my people, enemy, whoever you might be, you need to know that these are my people and I am God and no one can stand against me. No matter what it is, you can't stop me. I am God, whoever you might be. And the stench and foul smell of you will rise, for I have done great things. God is, is about to do something in among his Israelites, his followers, his believers, that they had given up hope on. You know, they had turned away from God. They knew their cultural heritage of following after God in the back of their minds, but they weren't doing it in their day-to-day -day lives. And, and, and they had been um, uh, fallen away from the things of God, and it had permeated every aspect of their lives, from their interactions to the way they talked with their families to the way they taught their children. And now God says, I want you to turn back to me, and let's just see what can happen with you and your family if you do. But you got to turn back first you, because you, you can't expect the blessing of God on the life of someone who is not pursuing God. And God's blessing may be completely different from what you anticipate his blessing being, but it can still be his blessing. I had a similar experience a couple days ago. Actually, I think it was yesterday, last two days. Of, there's a lot that's been happening. But I was talking, eating uh, dinner with my nephew. I think he's three. Is that right, Katie? He's three years old. And he was the last one at the table, as little kids tend to do. And I'm sitting there. His name's Mason. And we're talking about a lot of things, you know, as three-year-olds tend to do. And uh, I said, can you count? And he goes, yeah. And he, he counted. He goes, one, two, three, four, five. And then he shoves some macaroni in his mouth. And I said, can you count higher than that? You know, and I'm expecting him to go six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And he goes, oh, yeah. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> higher. Okay. He... He did what I asked of him, but it wasn't quite what I thought he was going to do. And that is similar sometimes to the way God blesses us. He will still accomplish his blessing, but it may not be what you were anticipating. It will still accomplish his will. It will still accomplish what he wants, but it may not be what you were expecting or in the manner you were expecting it or in the time you were expecting it. Because God isn't bound by our parameters. He is God. He is bound by his own. He can do what he wants and use us to accomplish his purposes. And so here we have him telling the Israelites, I want to come and I want to do something for you. You don't even have any idea. You, you, you don't even know how to anticipate, to prepare for, or even pray for what I'm about to drop on your heads. But you've got to turn to me first. You see, 
in you, he must reign before you can receive his reign. He's got to reign in your life before you can receive the reign of his blessing, before you can receive the reign of his spirit. You've got to allow him to reign in you. Allow him total control. Allow him the, the high seat in your heart. Take off the boxes of, of storage you've been placing there and, 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 and allow him back in his place of honor in your life. And now, for a lot of us, it may be like the Israelites. I mean, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know. God is supposed to be in charge of our lives. We know it. He has sent Jesus to die for us. He created us. He did all this stuff for us. And we know God is supposed to be chief. But we don't always act like it. In the decisions we make, in the plans we make, in, in how we operate in our day-to-day -day with our spouses, with our kids, we don't often operate that way. God says, you, you know, you need to shift a little bit in the way we think. Allow him to reign supreme in our lives because the Holy Spirit will reign on your life when you allow Jesus to reign in your heart. And here's the thing about reign. It dries. You know, we know from Scripture that the moment we get the Holy Spirit, we have him, and he never leaves us. He never leaves us. He's always there. However, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that we are to be filled with the Spirit. The implication is, then, that we're not always filled with him, that we can have him and not be filled up with him. You see, if the only Holy Spirit you're getting throughout the week is an hour on Sundays and on occasion, an hour on Wednesday nights, you're going to be parched. You're going to be thirsty. You're not going to have the sustenance you need to be sustained. I mean, if we're drinking water only for an hour on Sunday mornings, you're going to die. You can't handle it. You need refreshing throughout the day, much less throughout the week. You need to be taking part in, in an experience with the Lord daily. Otherwise, you're just not going to make this life spiritually. You're going to get by with the, with the amount of Holy Spirit he gives us the moment we get saved, and you're going to get to heaven, as Scripture tells us, by the skin of your teeth. You believed in Jesus, and that's all we need to get to heaven. That is it. Hear me. That's all we need. Believing in Jesus, death and resurrection. That's all we need. But once we get there... As I say repeatedly, we want him to tell us, well done, good and faithful servant. You made me happy in the way you lived your life. But if we're doing jack squat for Jesus, what are we even here for? You know, we need that refresher from him. We need to, to take part in him consistently, daily. We need to be a part of a small group and have them pour into our lives. I love what my small group's been doing the last, last week. Uh, uh, we have been... Uh, contacting each other during the week. It was an assignment by one of our small group teachers that we were supposed to contact somebody throughout the week, and then somebody would contact us. And it was a fantastic thing. Uh, you know, the, we had a conversation. I had one with my wife the other day that probably the guys and the girls in our class interpreted it differently. Uh, girls are thinking, okay, I need to get together with this person and eat, and we can talk and drink coffee and tea and for hour two hours. Guys are thinking, okay, this is a five-minute phone call at most, and I can take care of this. I'll shoot them a text. All right, I'm good. And it's just different the way you think, but to have somebody pour into you spiritually, be able to pour into somebody else spiritually, it, it is far and away what God intended for our lives. We weren't supposed to go through this life alone and try to accomplish everything that's in it by ourselves. We're supposed to have the Spirit guiding us through every day, and we're supposed to have other believers helping us through the day process all of that stuff that goes on in this life. So two questions. Have you drunk at all? If you don't know Jesus, you haven't. You can know, have all the head knowledge in the world and know about God and know about Jesus dying and you think, okay, whatever. But you're not still making him the Lord of your life, putting him in charge in you. It's time to readjust. It's time to pursue him. It's time to acknowledge, okay, I need to move from simply knowing Jesus to actually believing in him and having faith in him and following him and making him reign in me. So do you believe in Jesus, death and resurrection? That's question one. Have you drunk at all? And the other question is, if you were to take spiritual inventory 
right now at this second, are you parched? Are you thirsty? And you don't even know it, maybe. Maybe you've been struggling and you can't figure out why. Maybe, maybe there's been some issues. Maybe there's been some problems. And you are spiritually parched. And you need that rain to pour down in you with, with all force and all power. And you need to receive it. Well, it starts, step one, with making Jesus reign in you. Making him the top, making him supreme, making him in charge. Is Jesus reigning in you? Because he wants to pour out the rain of his spirit on you, to fill you up. Have you drunk of his spirit at all? Are you parched? Are you full? 